So I'd like to start with a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is that I am not a biomedical expert by any means. As you can probably tell from the way I'm dressed, in addition to my CCL affiliation, I'm at the Sloan School of Management. And I got interested in healthcare really for personal reasons. About 15 years ago, friends and family were dealing with various kinds of cancer. And through that process, I realized that data science and financial engineering have a lot to do with cancer drug development. That's what I want to talk to you about today. So I want to start with the observation that we are living through a very unusual period. Biomedicine is at an inflection point. Now, how do I know this? Well, because my colleagues, Susan Hockfield, Tyler Jackson, and Phil Sharp told me so. In a 2016 publication called Convergence, they pointed out that we are in a period of convergence between the life sciences, the physical sciences, and engineering. And the name that many people in the industry use for this is the omics revolution. Genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, all of these omics have had tremendous advances over the last even just five years, never mind 10. There's one exception, though, one omics that's become a bottleneck in this business, and that is economics, because you've got to have to pay for stuff. And the business models that we're using really haven't changed a lot over the last 20 years, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, the core of the business model in healthcare is what I call the fundamental law of healthcare finance, which is this equation. Being at MIT, every slide the deck that I use has to have at least one equation, and this is my equation. The expected value of a drug program is given by just three terms. The present value of profits if your drug gets approved, multiplied by the probability that it does get approved, minus the cost of developing that drug. That's it. Now, economists can tell you a lot about the present value of profits. We can tell you a lot about the costs of developing drugs. But we can tell you nothing about the probability of success, because that's a scientific and engineering problem. And so the question is, how difficult is it to develop a drug? It turns out that for oncology, which is what I got interested in to begin with, it takes about $200 million in out-of-pocket costs to run the clinical trials to develop that drug. It takes about 10 years to run those trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. And in oncology, historically, the probability of success is a little less than 5%. So this is not a very exciting endeavor from an investment point of view. It's pretty low odds of success. But if you are successful in developing an anti-cancer compound, congratulations, because you'll be making about $2 billion a year for the following 10 years, which amounts to $12.3 billion payday in year 10. And so what are the returns? About 12% per year over that period of the first 10 years of development, well, what's the risk? We measure risk in terms of standard deviation, and the volatility or standard deviation is 423.5%. Way too risky. Most investors will not willingly invest in a project like this over such a long time span. This is where financial engineering can play a role. Instead of investing in one of these projects, what if we invested in 150 of them all at the same time? Now, I know that's going to require 150 times 200 million or $30 billion. Where are we going to get $30 billion? And as an economist, I have a very simple answer. The answer is, assume we have $30 billion. <laughs> if we do, if we do, then it turns out that for 150 projects, each with a 5% probability of success, and assuming that they're statistically independent, the likelihood of getting at least three successes out of 150 tries is a whopping 98%. I've got a 98% chance of producing $36.9 billion over a 10-year period. And so this is incredibly attractive. And so that's where I'm going to get the $30 billion. Not for me. I don't have it. From all of you, because with these odds, you're going to want to invest in this. But can we do better? I think we can. What if we were able to change the odds, improve the odds? And how do we do that? Well, machine learning. Take the tools that I used for doing credit scoring in financial data 
and apply it to handicapping clinical trial outcomes. Using the largest database of those outcomes, my collaborators and I used a standard random forest model with over 200 different features. Features about the drug itself, about the disease, about the clinical trial design, about the particular trial sponsor. And using those 200 different features, we're actually able to predict clinical trial outcomes, not perfectly, but to enough of a degree that it changes the odds. We published our paper in 2019 in Harvard Data Science Review, hoping that other people would take these ideas and use them. Our code has been deposited in GitHub, so we've made it public. And it turns out that one of the readers was the head of data science at Novartis, one of the largest drug companies in the world. And so Nick Kelly approached us and said, how would you like to collaborate with Novartis to see whether or not your models can be improved upon? I said, sure, we're happy to do that as long as you allow us to publish the results. He said, no problem. What we're going to do is to hold an internal data science and AI challenge. We're going to ask Novartis experts to try to beat your model. And so we let it run. Over a five-month period, over 300 participants, 50 different teams, submitted 3,000 different models to try to improve on ours. Now, they had a head start. They had our models. We gave them our models. The data vendor licensed the data to them. And over that period of time, they developed a number of interesting alternatives. Did they win? Well, I'm not going to tell you the answer. You're going to have to read the paper. We published it. <laughs> Here it is. But the results were useful and interesting enough that one of my postdocs, Shomesh Chowdhury, decided that he wanted to do this full time. So he and I started a company called QLS Advisors. And we're now using these models to help biotech and pharma companies and their investors improve the odds of drug development. So let me conclude by pointing out that you know, we've had a war on cancer since 1971. And as an outsider to the biomedical industry, I'm not qualified to tell you whether we're winning or losing that war. I think we are winning, but I'm not sure. However, as an economist, I can tell you that war is the wrong metaphor, because war is based upon fear and hate. And those are not sustainable. Greed, on the other hand, is very sustainable. <laughs> instead, of, instead of declaring war on cancer, how about putting a price tag on its head? Finance does not have to be a zero-sum game if we don't let it. And those of us that are in the financial industry, we may think that finance is the be-all and end-all. But for most other people, it is a means to an end, not an end unto, unto itself. With the right business models, the right amount of financing, we can achieve that mythical state of actually being able to do well by doing good. Thank you.